take your Bibles this morning, turn to Mark chapter 6. <clears throat> Mark chapter 6. I'm going to see a story that's told in three of the four different Gospels. Uh, when something is reiterated more than once in the Scriptures, it must be of some importance. And we see this story in Matthew chapter 14, here in Mark chapter 6, and also in Luke chapter 9. And uh, basically, it's the story of the boy with the loaves and the fish. And typically in this story, the, the boy, the young boy with the loaves and his giving heart and things is a focal point of the story. Uh, but I'm going to give you my outline this morning before we even begin, uh, because we're going to be looking at different characters throughout this passage. Uh, we're going to be looking at the disciples. Uh, we're going to be looking at the congregation. And then we're going to be looking at Jesus Christ and His attitude toward these things. Uh, so the boy is not going to be a part of the message this morning, other than the fact that he gave his lunch. But there's much to be learned from this passage of Scripture. And I think that uh, looking at the congregation, looking at uh, the disciples, and looking at the attitude of Jesus, there's something in the story for each one of us uh, today, and hopefully uh, you'll listen attentively and, and just be praying and asking God to, to give you what the Lord has for you uh, from the Scriptures. Let's pray and then we'll read this. Father, again, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us this morning to uh, come to your house to be able to hear from your Word. I pray that you just uh, use this story in the Scriptures, uh, reiterated three times throughout the Gospels, uh, Lord, for a purpose. And I pray that you'll show each one of us that purpose for us this morning uh, through this passage. And I pray you'll use it for your honor and glory's sake. I pray that good decisions will be made that need to be made today. We ask and pray this in your name. Amen. If you look there in Mark chapter 6, we'll read verses 7 through 13, and then we'll skip on down to verse 30. Starting in verse 7 of chapter 6, and he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. And commanded them that they should uh, take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no script, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from the place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment uh, than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. He said, Pastor, you're just messed up in the head. You told us this was a story of the boy and the fishes, uh, the bread and the fishes. Um, well, I had to lay a foundation here uh, because the disciples is part of this story. And I want to show you what's happening before this all takes place. Now look at verse 30. Verse 30 it says, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. So we see Jesus sending the disciples out two by two. Uh, they're going out. They're preaching with the power of God. Miracles are being done. And they come back and they begin to explain to Jesus everything that took place. In verse 31, he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. Here I'm sure they're looking forward to this rest. Here they've been out on the, on the road, they've been traveling, uh, you know, they've been rejected in some places, accepted in others. Uh, they're excited, but I'm sure that they, like many of us, are just glad to have a vacation. You ever working and you know, it's the last day of work before vacation? You just don't feel like you get a whole lot done because you're already mentally on vacation. Uh, this is where the disciples are at right now. In verse 32, they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and outwent them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were a sheep, uh, as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him, and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far, uh, far past. Send them away, and they, uh, that they may go into the country round about 
into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew they say five and two fishes, he commanded them to make all sit down by com companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the uh, five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven. He blessed and uh, broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two uh, fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. Several aspects of this story that you can really dig deep into and, and find all different kinds of things for us. But this morning, uh, starting out, I want us to, to look at the disciples. Now, a disciple means that they were a learner or a worker of Christ. And this is what they were doing at this point. As we read earlier in uh, verses 7 through 13... Jesus had just sent them out. He had given them power to go out to work miracles, to do great and mighty things in the name of Jesus. And they were excited to come back. They were excited to tell them or tell Jesus what had done or what had been done. The people that had been saved, the miracles that had taken place. And it's interesting. I read that story because there's an interesting question or statement that Jesus makes unto the disciples here in the midst of all of this. You know, they're there, this is their break, this is their time off, this is their vacation, and all the congregation begins to follow them. They go out into a desert place, and they're ready to send them home. It's getting dark, it's getting late, this is our, this is our time. You know, they need to go find something to eat. And Jesus makes the statement, we see in verse 37, Give ye them to eat. What? Now, did Jesus give them the power to work all miracles? He did. Did they go forth two by two working miracles? They did. So what happened? You know, what is the attitude at this point of the disciples? You know, they were commissioned to go and spread the gospel. They had gone. They had spread the gospel. But now is downtime. Now is time for break. Now is time for vacation. You know, should we ever take time off of God? If God has told us to go, should we ever stop going? You know, even if we're out and we're taking a trip and we're on vacation, there's nothing that says that we can't tell somebody about Jesus while we're on vacation. You know, this is their time away. And as we look at this story, the disciples had a wonderful opportunity here to show Jesus what they had been doing. Not just tell them. Look back, if you would, at verse 7 again. It says, And he called unto him uh, the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. He gave them the power to go and cast out demons. He gave them the power to go and work mighty miracles. And they went out and they were busy for the cause of Christ. You know, they didn't have the leisure time. Look at verse 31. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. You know, they didn't have the time to even take a break to eat anything. They were just going and going and going. All right, this is your time. This is your opportunity. You know, when is the last time we got so busy for Jesus that we forgot to eat? You know, that's busy. You know, I used to work construction. And there was days when I was working. And, you know, I, I was trying to get a project done. And I wouldn't... I, you know, I forget to eat. You know, eating is not a priority to me. You know, some people, eating is a priority. Uh, and I can understand if you've got diabetes or something like that, you need to make it a priority. Uh, but it's not one of those things that, you know, I'm living for the next meal. Uh, you know, so I can get busy and I can get working and I can forget to take time to eat. 
And I imagine that's how the disciples were. They were so excited going out uh, with, with this new power that Christ had given them over the unclean spirits, with this power to go and work mighty works and, and great miracles, and they're, out and they're having the time of their lives. And they get back, and they're weary because, you know, finally they, they're, they're getting a break. They're excited to get this much-needed break. But in the midst of this break, what happened to their compassion? What happened to their desire to help people? What does verse 36 tell us? Send them away, that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Did they forget about Jesus and the woman at the well? Saying, hey, you know, I've got water to drink that you'll thirst no more. Where, you know, he's, he, he describes himself as the bread of life. See, these people were there and they were hungering for Jesus. But now the disciples, once they're off their campaign, off the trail, uh, they're back home and they're thinking about themselves. They're thinking about their stomach. They're thinking about their physical needs. So instead of making themselves look worldly, instead of making themselves look like they're lacking compassion, what are they going to do? Push it off on the people. You know, these people, you know, they need to go and they need to buy themselves something to eat. You know, we cannot feed them. But what had they been doing? They have been feeding them. Now, it wasn't of the food that they had thought of, but they were spiritually feeding them. And what is more important, the physical or the spiritual? The spiritual. But they have lost sight of the spiritual because now they're focused on the physical. Send them away. Now, when they made that statement, were they thinking about the people or were they thinking about themselves? They want to make it sound like it's the people they're concerned about. Send them, send them away. That they may go into the country roundabout and into the villages and buy themselves bread. For they have nothing to eat. They had nothing to eat, but they did. They had the spiritual food right there. The disciples had access to the spiritual food. God had, or Jesus Christ had commissioned them to go out and spread the gospel. He had commissioned them to go and feed the people. I think Mr. McDonald, he was speaking a few weeks ago about uh, Peter and, and feeding my sheep. Or maybe I was speaking about, I don't remember. But, you know, we are talking about that a few weeks ago. Yeah, Jesus commands us to go and feed my sheep. And this is the commission that he had sent them out with. Feed them. Feed them. They're hungering. They need the gospel. Feed them. But they lose that compassion. Verse 37 says, He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? See, here they're lacking vision, and they're lacking faith. See, the vision would be, let's see what kind of, what, what do we have here that we can feed them with? The faith comes into, this is what we have, let's feed them. See, this was Jesus' answer to them. What do we have? Well, there's a young lad here. He's got a couple loaves and a couple fish, but what are they among so many? Where's their faith? What are they among so many? And I would have to venture to say that if any one of us was sitting there in the disciples' position, we'd be saying the same thing. <laughs> what are these among so many? Because are we going to feed even our church on fellowship night we come in and there's two pieces of fish and a few little biscuits sitting there on a plate. 
we're going to be saying, man, this is the lousiest fellowship ever. It doesn't matter how good the fish is or how good the biscuits are. We're going to be saying, man, there's, <laughs> there's not enough here. This cannot feed all of us. And every one of us, no matter how spiritual we think we are, would be saying the exact same thing the disciples were saying here. What are they among so many? 5,000 men. Now, when's the last time you'd been in a crowd of 5,000 men? I'd have to venture to say that the last time I was in a crowd that had 5,000 men plus women and children was probably uh, at a professional baseball game. Uh, or, you know, some, some sporting event where you got the, the stadium packed. And if you look around, you think, yeah, we're going to feed all these people with two fish and a few loaves. Not happening. It's not happening. <coughs> Excuse me. Where's our faith? Where is our faith? See, and Jesus, he, he did these things, not just for the people's sake, but I think also for the disciples' things, or sake. Here he had given them great opportunity to go out two by two and do all these miracles. It doesn't list all the miracles that the disciples had done. It doesn't list everything that they went out and uh, the demons they'd cast out or, or you know, maybe the lame that they've allowed to, uh, to, to grain, uh, gain strength in their legs and to walk and all the... It doesn't list, but they came back excited. So that tells me that they were able to do great things. But I believe Jesus is here saying, listen, there's greater things that you can do. Yes, you did great things, but you still lack faith. You did great things, and I, I believe that this also is used as a, a lesson of humility. Because they come back boasting of great things. But yet, who did the greatest thing? It was Jesus. It was Jesus, and I, I think that he... He needed to make them realize, knock them down a notch, saying, listen, I've given you the power. I've given you the command to go. You, you fulfilled it. You did a great job. You went out and, and you, yeah, you went and, and uh, ministered and, and did great things. But when you come back and you're lacking the compassion for the people, I think you're missing the boat because your focus is on the great things. It's not on the people. It's not on the people. And Jesus sets the people down into groups and, and he begins to break the bread and break the fish and the disciples are being used as servants, go out and they begin to pass out the fish, the bread. And as a result, they're all fed. Then he says, all right, go out and gather up what's left. And they gathered up more than they started with. Well, how does that happen? Jesus. Miracle took place. Where was their faith? Again, in verse 37, give ye them to eat. You know, these were the same guys who were given the power to heal. The same power to cast out demons. He was giving them this opportunity to perform this miracle. But where was their faith? How many times do we miss out on God's opportunities for us to do something great, but we lack the faith? We lack the faith. See, God wants great things done from us here at Old Paz Baptist Church. He's wanting to use you to do great things, but often I think that we find ourselves in the same position the disciples find themselves in lacking faith. See, they were willing, but their faith was weak. In verse 38, it says, He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say five and two fishes. Christ said, Go and see. And they, in obedience, went to see. You know, they didn't question his commands. They didn't question his judgments. They didn't question the call of Christ. 
And when asked if they would feed them, they didn't have the spiritual insight to see uh, what they had. They didn't even take time to look. It took Jesus giving them this insight. This is a, a big uh, training uh, for, or a, a teaching point for the disciples. Jesus is using this as an opportunity. And I think, again, many of us fall into this category with the disciples. I think we have a heart to do something for God. We want to do something for God. But when it comes time for us to see something really happen, what happens? We lack the compassion. Or we lack the faith to get it done. Some having compassion, the Bible says, doing what? Making a difference. We need to have the faith and the obedience in God to make it happen. But we've got to have a care and a compassion for the people. What about the congregation here? You know, these people had a real desire to learn and hear from Christ. They had a real desire. Look at verse 33. And the people saw, uh, saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. First thing that we see about the congregation here is they followed him. Where did they follow him to? I believe they followed him into a desert place. They followed him into a place where there was a heartache, a place of suffering. You know, the, the desert isn't somewhere that you just go to take a hike. You know, it's not somewhere where you go spend a day of vacation. You know, they went to the desert place to hear and to learn about Jesus. You know, the desert is a place where food and water uh, supplies are in a shortage. It's not some place where you go and, and just think that you're going to be able to buy water at the next convenience store. You're not going to buy bread at that next uh, you know, stop along the way. Uh, it's a desert place. And they were willing to follow Jesus really without the necessary things of this world to get close to him. See, this says something to me about the congregation they had a desire to learn about Jesus. They gave up the cares of the world to follow Him. They gave up the job that they were working at the time. They left their family at the time. Or they grabbed their family by the hand and said, Listen, let's follow Jesus. They had a care. They had a concern to follow Him. In verse 39, in verse 40, it says this, and he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass, and they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. So we see Jesus commanding the disciples to get the congregation together and to set them down into groups. And what they do? They listen. They sat down. They obeyed him. So here is a, a group of people that have a real desire to follow him, they catch up with him. They obey him. Now, I'm not sure they had a clue as to what Christ was getting ready to do. You know, I don't, I, I don't imagine they thought, well, we're going to sit down, we're going to eat, we're going to have a good meal, we're going to listen to the teachings of Christ. You know, I, I don't have any idea, and I don't think they had any idea what Jesus was getting ready to do, but they obeyed anyway. You know, so often... You know, we get into an argument of mode with Christ. God tells us to do something. Well, why would you want us to do that? God says, well, I want you to head this direction. Well, why do you want me to go that way? And we start acting like little kids. We've got to know the answer. But that's not faith. Faith is listening to God getting direction from God, and doing what God tells us to do without question. That's what these people were doing. Because of their obedience, they were able to be a part of God's blessing. Because they listened to Him, they were blessed. They ate their fill of what Christ had for them. 
Verse 42 says, And they did all eat and were filled. You know, if we're filled in what Christ gives us, I bet you that was the best meal those people had ever eaten. You know, Thanksgiving's coming up. You know, Thanksgiving is the holiday to get fat. You know, that is the fat, the first of the fat season, uh, Thanksgiving. You know, so we, we look and we plan for this great big meal. And, and boy, it's going to be the best meal of the year. We're going to have the, you know, the, the roast beef or we're going to have the turkey. We're going to have the ham. You know, we're going to go out and we're going to go uh, pull out all stops. And we're going to be making cookies and cakes and, and stuffing and mashed potatoes and gravy. And, and it's just going to be a spread and we're going to eat and eat and eat. And boy, it's going to be a wonderful day. <laughs> until that evening when we're so sick uh, that we ate too much. Uh, but it's going to be a great day. And you look back at past Thanksgivings, and you know, and, and everybody's mom is the best cook, or everybody's grandma is the best cook. Uh, you know, see, so you look back at past Thanksgivings, and you think, boy, that was a wonderful meal that grandma made. That was a great meal that mom made. Boy, that was great. And we look, but you know what? I don't think there was a better meal than the meal that Jesus made. They ate and they were filled. Whenever we take and we eat that which Christ has given to us, do we eat until we're filled on it? You know, look at your own devotions this morning. Did you take the time to get filled off of what Jesus had for you? Did you take the time to learn from the scriptures and get what he wanted for you in your life? When you come to church and you're sitting and hearing about the Bible, are you attentively listening to receive everything and be filled on what Christ has for you? See, that was the eagerness of the congregation. As a Christian, we need to have the power. We need to have the faith. We need to have the obedience in our life to be Christ-like. To be Christ-like. We're not commanded to be like Him, but we are commanded to be Christ-like. There's a difference. See, there's no way we could be like Christ. Christ. He was perfect. He didn't have that sin nature that we are born with. But we are trying or we should try and strive to live like him to the best of our ability. And that brings us to the third individual in our story. We see the disciples. We see the congregation. But what about Christ? We know that he was a teacher of the people just as we should be a teacher of the people. As we go out as a Christian and we're living our Christian life, we ought to go out and we ought to live a life, an example, a testimony, teaching others how Christians ought to live. Jesus taught with his life and his actions, just as we ought to be teaching with our life and with our actions. As we go to our jobs, as we go through our daily lives, you, you young people in school, as you go forth, you ought to be teaching with your actions that this is how a Christian ought to live. You shouldn't have to go out with a big old billboard sign around your neck saying, I'm a Christian. You shouldn't have to go out saying, hey, I'm a Christian. We shouldn't have to go out and yelling it from the rooftops. People ought to just know that there's something different about that individual because he lives different than most people. We ought to have that testimony as we go out and we teach with our life. We know that Jesus, according to this passage, taught the things of God with compassion. He had compassion on the people. When we have compassion on people, that means that our cares aren't so important to us anymore. Our own personal concerns, our own personal cares. When we have compassion on people, we're going to leave our needs and our desires behind and focus on the needs of others. 
That's compassion. And Jesus had compassion on the people. We know that he was well versed in the scriptures. He was the scriptures. <laughs> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We are to be like Christ, being well versed in the scriptures, so that when we go out having compassion on people, we can take the scriptures, we can take the Word of God, we can take the gospel to individuals and say, listen, out of a heart of compassion, out of an example of my life that I'm living, this is what Christ has done for you. This is what he has to offer, and this is what you need to do to have that fulfilled Christian life. How do we as Christians compare to Christ as one who teaches? Do we teach by our example, as Jesus did? Do we teach with compassion, as Jesus did? Are we well versed in the scriptures as Jesus was? There was no limitation to the power of Christ. And I think so often we limit ourselves just as the disciples limited themselves. There was no limitation to their power. There is no limitation to our power. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1, all power is given unto you in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and preach the gospel. Are we utilizing the power that has been given unto us? Oh, we've got stories we can tell about how we've gone out and boy, how God has been able to use us to see maybe a soul saved here or a soul saved there. And boy, we get excited about those things. Just as the disciples got excited about going out to the different communities and the different towns and, and working the miracles and doing those things. But in our own personal life, can we say that that's a, a way of life? Or does our faith hinder us when it comes to really showing who Christ is? Again, verse 34 says, He had compassion on the people. When he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them. How compassionate are we toward these kids that we have downstairs that come from Many of them come from broken homes. I know mornings like this morning, they can be trying. You get kids that want to mouth back. They don't want to shut up. They don't want to listen. They want to be a distraction. You know, I'm not saying that you just let them continue to be there because you got such a compassion. Sometimes you got to remove them so others can learn about Christ. And we ended up having to do that this morning with a couple of kids. But do we have a compassion for these kids? You know, I work with these kids on a daily basis. And it'd make your head spin if you knew some of the situations these kids have to grow up in. You know, I, I, I hear and I see how some of these kids have to live day after day after day, and it burdens me for these kids. And it'd do you good maybe to go out on a Saturday with some of these bus workers and make visits to see some of the homes these kids have to, to live in. They don't have a choice. That's their home. And many of them don't realize, but that's their normal. So they don't realize how bad they've they may have it. But do we have a compassion for the children? While the disciples thought about the food they were lacking, Jesus Christ was thinking about the food that the people were lacking. That was the spiritual food. We need to take Christ's example and see what he can do with us today.
Do we have the compassion to make the difference? He's given us the opportunities. He's given us the power. But we've got to have the desire. We've got to have the drive. We've got to have the compassion. Where is our faith? The Bible says some having a compassion, making a difference. What kind of a difference are you going to make for Christ?